friends, can I welcome you tonight to our Good Friday service here in Christ Church in Castle Dawson. Um, I must say it's a little bit surreal being in the church, uh, just the two of us this evening, um, thinking about Good Friday and thinking about what Jesus was prepared to do for us. The theme of tonight's service is this Jesus must die. Now that probably sounds a little bit gruesome to you. Um, but actually that was all part of God's plan that Jesus would indeed die. So tonight we're going to have a series of scripture readings, uh, a scripture reading then followed by a monologue. So we have seven scripture readings followed by seven monologues. Uh, and in between uh, the monologue then and the reading, we're going to have uh, some pieces of music, some hymns, uh, some pieces you've, uh, which are well known and you've heard many times, but maybe a couple of other pieces there which, to be honest, I have only discovered recently um, and I thought were really powerful pieces and totally appropriate for Good Friday. So I hope uh, that you will find these pieces both inspirational uh, and maybe perhaps at the same time a little bit challenging. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they laid him in a tomb? Were you, there, were you there when they all said, Jesus must die? Let's begin with prayer. Lord, at times it causes us to tremble when we consider the sorrow, pain and suffering you so freely took upon yourself for us. As we follow you to the cross, we can't help but ask why this horrible thing must happen. How is it that the shouts of Hosanna have so quickly turned to shouts of crucify him? But deep down we know, deep down we know whose sin caused your death. It was our sin, our rejection, our treason that brought you to Calvary. Yes, we were truly there. We humbly pray that your love, forgiveness and mercy that so greatly offended us may be extended to us. Grant that we may die to our sin and so be raised to new life with you. We ask all this and everything else in the words that you have given us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our first reading this evening is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, verses 1 to 10, the story of Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was very wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be at the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anyone out of anything, I will pay back four times that amount. Jesus said to him, 
Today, salvation has come to this house because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save that which was lost. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now each of our monologues is going to be read for us by Alana. I'll never forgive Jesus for that. Of all the people he could have stayed with, why Zacchaeus? Of all the inhabitants of Jericho, Zacchaeus was the worst possible choice. Zacchaeus was a traitor, a turncoat. He had sold out to the enemy. And to top it all off, he was rich in the process. You've got to hand it to the Romans. They're as smart as they are cruel. They knew how much we Israelites hated paying their stinking taxes, yet no one likes taxes. But it's twice as bad when the money goes to the empire that has conquered your country and now occupies it. And so who do the Romans get to collect their taxes? Do they send in Roman tax collectors? No. They hire our people to do their dirty work. And how do they pay these traitors? Tax collectors can charge whatever they want and get away with it. And after they sent in what the room expects, they get to keep whatever's left. No questions asked. What sort of people would help the enemy and steal from their own people at the same time? I'll tell you what kind. Greedy swine who are out to make easy money even if it means working for the Romans and stealing from your own people. And that's exactly the kind of person Zacchaeus is. Someone who betrayed his own people and happily got rich off their toil and labor. And through it all helped the Romans in power. And oh, how rich he became in the process. He admits it himself. He promises to give half of his possession to the poor and repay all of those he defrauded four times as much. Where do you think he got that money in the first place? He got it from us. He's cheated us and robbed us for years, while all the time he's lived high and mighty. And now he thinks that he can make it all better by giving back part of what he's stolen. He makes me sick. It makes me sick, sick to even think about it. And now how does he get repaid for all of this evil? What's his punishment for selling out his own people? Jesus declares him saved, saved. Of all people, Jesus says salvation has come to Zacchaeus. It's not right, it's not fair. Jesus has no right to say Zacchaeus will be saved. Zacchaeus is the worst kind of sinner. Jesus is way out of line. He's really kind of dangerous. Something should be done about him. We can't stand for this. This Jesus must die. Oh 
crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Our second reading is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 13, and beginning at verse 10. This is when Jesus heals the crippled woman on the Sabbath day. One Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in the synagogue. A woman there had an evil spirit that had made, that had made her ill for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called out to her, Woman, you are free from your illness. He placed his hands on her and at once she straightened herself up and praised God. The official in the synagogue was angry that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. So he spoke up and he said to the people, There are six days in which we should work. So come during those days and be healed, but not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, you hypocrites. Any one of you would untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and take it out to give it water on the Sabbath. Now here is a descendant of Abraham whom Satan had kept bound for 18 years. Should she not be released on the Sabbath? His answer made his enemies ashamed of themselves while the people rejoiced over all the wonderful things that he did. This is the word 
of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now our second monologue. I resent being called a hypocrite. I was just doing my job. I was the leader of the synagogue. I had to say something. I wasn't the one in the wrong. Jesus was the one making all of the trouble. Now I know what you're all thinking. You're all thinking Jesus did, all Jesus did was heal this poor woman. How could that be wrong? It's not that Jesus healed her, it's when he healed her. He healed her on the Sabbath. Healing is considered work and work is plainly forbidden on the Sabbath. Now that's not my idea. I didn't come up with that rule, God did. It's the third commandment. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and owe all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath. To the Lord your God, you shall not do any work. This Jesus was not right to go around breaking God's commandments whenever he feels like it. This may sound harsh, but it really isn't. Following God's commandments give order and structure to our lives. What would happen if people decided to stop following the fifth commandment? You shall not kill. Society would just fall into chaos. And that's why something as simple as healing on the Sabbath must be stopped. If that kind of thinking spreads, it could lead to all kinds of trouble. Now don't misunderstand me. I'm not upset that Jesus healed this poor woman. It was a great act of kindness and an impressive demonstration of God's healing power, but just not on the Sabbath. Why couldn't he have just waited a few hours to heal her? Soon the Sabbath would have ended and then everything would have been fine. She's been this way for 18 years. Would a few more hours really have made any difference? If he had just waited, we could have avoided all of this trouble. But for whatever reason, Jesus didn't wait. He just forged ahead, breaking law, ignoring our tradition, making a mockery of our way of life. And not only that, he drove a wedge between those of us in authority and the common people. Those of us with positions of leadership have no choice but to question his acts. It is our job to defend the tradition. But the common people are so swept up in Jesus' teachings and healings, they can't see the larger picture. They don't see how dangerous this Jesus is. We must put a stop to this. Jesus can't be allowed to continue to cause trouble. He's dangerous. This Jesus must die.
Our third scripture reading is again from Luke's Gospel, chapter 6, beginning at verse 27. Love your enemies. Looking at his disciples, he said, But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other one also. If someone takes your cloak, do not stop him from taking your tunic as well. Give to everyone who asks, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now our third monologue. I can't believe this is happening. My teenage son has just come home spouting some philosophy that's bound to get him into trouble. Those of you who are parents of teenagers will understand what I'm talking about. You know how impressionable teenagers are. They're always excited about whatever's the newest craze, no matter how crazy it is. One of the toughest jobs in the world has got to be training kids and keeping them on the right track. The last thing we need is some crazy preacher filling our kids' heads with new and revolutionary ideas, especially dangerous ideas. What kind of dangerous ideas, you might ask? How about this, for starters? Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who abuse you. Can you believe it? That's the idea. That's the kind of ideas my kids are coming home with. And if that's not bad enough, this crazy preacher is telling my kids that if someone hits them, they should just stand there and get hit a second time. He's, he says, if a thief steals your coat, take off your shirt and give that to him as well. And then my favorite, give to everyone who begs. Can you believe it? He tells them to give to beggars. There's nothing worse than walking down a big city street and seeing all those beggars. And you know that whatever you give them won't make a bit of a difference. It's just like throwing your hard earned money away. If I've told my children once, I've told them a thousand times, give beggars sympathy, not money. But do they listen to what we teach them? No. They'd rather listen to some preacher who doesn't have anything to give away. They'd rather listen to someone who sums up his philosophy like this. Do to others as you would have them to do to you. Can you believe that? This guy's got it all backwards. It's supposed to be. Do to others what they do to you. I've no trouble being good to those who are good to me. And that's what I've taught my children. But this idea of loving your enemies and giving without getting back, that's just ridiculous. I don't want my children throwing their lives away. I want my children to be happy and successful. And like it or not, that means you've got to be tough. You've got to watch out for yourself. Take what's yours and fight your own rights. You know, this really ticks me off. I try to raise my kids to be responsible successful people and then this Jesus comes along and fills their heads with all sorts of mush. This Jesus is dangerous. Someone should do something about him. We can't just sit around, let him teach our children all this kind of stuff. This Jesus must be silenced. This Jesus must die. Now the
Our fourth reading is from John's Gospel, chapter 8, beginning at the second verse. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group, and they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, he commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as to trap Jesus in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write in the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, they who heard began to go away, one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened himself up and said to her, Where are they? Is there no one left to condemn you? No one, sir, she answered. Well then, Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go, but do not sin again. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now our fourth monologue. I was among the Pharisees who brought that shameful woman to Jesus. We knew it was his custom to go and teach at the temple, and we were sure we would find him there. And now we finally had a perfect opportunity to clear up all of this confusion. It's one thing to talk about forgiving sinners. It's another to deal with a sinner who was caught in the act. We were sure Jesus couldn't waste his way out of this one. Once and for all, we could make him acknowledge that sinners must pay. Everything was going perfectly at first. The adulterous woman never once denied her guilt, never once even begged for mercy like the rest of us. She knew she was doing wrong. She knew she deserved punishment. God's law must be upheld. Everything was going perfectly. Even Jesus made no reply at first. He just bent over and started drawing on the ground. At last, the great teacher had nothing to say. There was no way he could get out of this one. This woman deserved death. When Jesus finally did speak, I thought he had one, one for sure. He said, let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. He admitted she deserved death. We had won. Jesus couldn't deny the law this time. I started looking around for a stone to carry out the judgment. It was then that I realized something was wrong. The rest of the scribes and the Pharisees looked very uncomfortable. I couldn't believe my eyes. They weren't going to let this stop them, were they? We are the righteous people. We are the ones who follow the law. We make the proper sacrifices. We do what God expects of us. We have every right to judge this woman and then carry out the judgment. We were not caught sinning. She was. Then things went from bad to worse. Everyone just started walking away. These people who had done everything in their power to follow God's law had been chased off by this Jesus. Maybe none of us was completely without sin. Nobody's perfect, but we were surely better than this evil woman who stood before us. It was all I could do to keep from shouting to my colleagues to stop. What's the matter with all of you? I wanted to say, this woman deserves death. Don't let a little case of conscience cloud your judgment. Compared to her, 
We are the ones without any sin. But I said nothing. I just stood there as they all walked away. I finally left too. I couldn't believe this Jesus. He had won again. Now more than ever, I know how much he must be stopped. He can't go on making a mockery of our law and accusing good people of being sinners. He's dangerous. This Jesus must die.
Our fifth reading this evening is from Luke's Gospel once again, Luke chapter 15 and beginning at verse 11. The parable of the lost son. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in great need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now Alana is going to bring us our fifth monologue. This parable wrecked my life. I'm serious, it wrecked my life. Let me tell you how. My father and I were there when Jesus told this parable that you call the prodigal son. And it was almost as if he was talking about our family. My family has two sons, myself and my younger brother. And the similarities, unfortunately, don't end there. My younger brother is also a wasteful, spoiled, undisciplined, good for nothing. Of course, it took my father years to admit this. In the beginning, dad always had an excuse for why his little boy didn't measure up. Soon my brother didn't even need to make excuses. Dad would forgive him before he even asked. And of course, I played my part in our little family drama. I was the responsible one. I did my share of the work and my brother's share. Dad finally did come to his senses. Somehow my father found the courage to admit to himself that this could not continue. He knew it wasn't right. And so dad kicked my brother out. Those were the good days. We hired someone to take his place. And for the first time in years, the work started getting done. Schedules were met, productivity rose, everything went great. After a time, even my father seemed to accept the loss of his son in exchange for efficiency and increased profits. But that, then it happened. Jesus came along. My father and I just happened to be there when Jesus was teaching. He started telling parables, one about a lost sheep, a second about a lost coin, and then Jesus started the third parable. There was a man who had two sons. That was the beginning of the end. When the parable was over, my father was in tears and ran off, mumbling something about his poor baby boy. 
My father came home late that night. He was half carrying my brother, who was too drunk to even walk by himself. Before I could say anything, Dad announced that my brother was home to stay. That was all two years ago. We went bankrupt a few months after my brother came back home. My father fell sick and soon died because we couldn't afford a doctor. My brother disappeared soon after and I haven't seen him since. And me? I now work for a minimum wage on someone else's farm. And all because of Jesus and his parable. You know, I don't know if my father really even understood what Jesus was getting at in the parable. Jesus was talking about how God treats sinners, not how fathers should treat their sons. It makes me angry every time I think about it. Just look what kind of think that kind of thinking did to me. Can you imagine what would happen if God really forgave sinners like that? What was Jesus thinking? How could he say such things? Someone should stop him. He's dangerous. This Jesus must die. Our sixth reading is from Mark's Gospel, chapter 14, and beginning in verse 53. Jesus is before the Sanhedrin. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, elders, and teachers of the law came together. Peter followed from a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and there he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this man-made temple and in three days will build another that's not made by man. Yet even their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, are you going to answer us? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? He asked. 
You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For a moment there, I thought our case against this Jesus might not hold up. We had lined up so many witnesses to testify against him that surely two of them would have to agree on some sort of horrible thing that he had said or done. But we were having no such luck. None of their testimony was the same. I was afraid we were going to have to let him go. I knew Pilate would not have him executed if we couldn't pin something solid in him and back it up with at least two witnesses. And if ever anyone needed to be killed, it was Jesus. I had been hearing for months about the trouble he was causing, stirring up the crowds, arguing with the religious authorities, even claiming to be the Messiah. That's exactly what I needed. Some would be Messiah to stir up the mess masses and start an armed rebellion against Rome. Can you imagine the bloodshed and the destruction, not to mention the religious and political consequences? The last thing I needed was some blaspheming rabble rouser to mess up everything I had worked for. But now that we had finally brought him to trial, everything seemed to be slipping away. We were out of witnesses. We had proved nothing. We would have to let him go. I knew I only had one more chance and I knew it was a long shot. But what other choice did I have? I asked him straight out. Are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? And I didn't expect him to answer. I assumed he would just remain silent. I couldn't believe my ears when he answered. I am. And you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. It was more than I could have hoped for in my wildest dreams. Right there in front of everyone, he openly admitted being both the Messiah and God's son. We needed no more evidence. We needed no more witnesses. Pilate would have to do something now. Pilate would have to kill anyone who claimed to be kind of God. And this Jesus had just claimed to be both God and God's son. Pilate would never know what a favour he was doing me when he sentenced this Jesus to death. Finally, all my trouble would be over. Jesus' reputation as a teacher and healer and miracle worker would slowly fade away. His ragtag followers would disband and all of this nonsense would come to an end. Order would be restored. Jesus has caused enough trouble. Someone has to do something about it. He is dangerous. He has to be stopped. He has to be silenced. There's no doubt about it. This Jesus must die.
Now our final reading from Luke's Gospel, chapter 23, and beginning in verse 32. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar. They said to him, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what we deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, who was standing nearby, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, they stood at a distance watching all these things. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Can you believe this guy? Even as he hangs on the cross dying, he extends God's grace and mercy to those who don't deserve it. Who is he to say, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Doesn't he get it? Doesn't he realize that's exactly the kind of talk that got him crucified? We've had enough of his offering God's grace and mercy to the undeserving. He can't be allowed to continue forgiving sinners like that. What about us? What about us good religious people? What about those of us who try as hard as we can to do what God expects of us? We might not be perfect, but at least we try. Don't we deserve something for at least trying? I hate to admit it, but I resent the fact that Jesus freely offers sinners what I have worked so hard to earn. Now I understand why so many people thought Jesus must die. His notion of God's forgiveness really is offensive to those of us who try our best to earn God's salvation. And I always assumed it was only bad people thought Jesus must die. All of a sudden, the other things Jesus said from the cross make sense. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. I never thought they included me. It makes you wonder 
if we're as good as we think we are. We obviously need as much forgiveness as anyone else Jesus forgave. But it's too late now. Jesus is crucified. He's dead and buried. Without knowing it, we put to death the one God sent to save us. But we can't undo what we've done. It's out of our hands. It's up to God now. Now we're going to have our final piece of music again. This is a, a, a relatively new piece to me. And the title probably gives away what this song is about, but I really hope you're blessed through this song as I have been. The title of this song is simply this. Thank you. Before we play this song, I just want to, to remind you that today it is Friday, but Sunday is coming. Keep well, keep safe, keep home. Thank you.